We um we're at twelve nineteen. Let's see if we can get to thirteen hundred today. Let's see if we can get to thirteen hundred today. Uh, now, I normally have a notebook at hand, but we're just gonna do it live here. We'll do it live. We'll do it live. Do it live. I can. I'll write it and we'll do it live. All right, let's go. Let's get the show on the road, guys. Let's get the show on the road. Okay, so we're playing at 1200. All right, we'll play the Sicilian. We we have, and we'll play the Accelerated Dragon. Let's see if he does the open Sicilian. Maybe he goes Bishop's, okay, he does do the open Sicilian. And uh, we played this once before, the Accelerated Dragon, where you get your Bishop out very, very quickly. Now he's gone C3, sort of XQC style. And that's not a great move because it takes away the natural developing square from his Knight. So now after knight f6, we attack his pawn, and he's got to make this very awkward, ooh. Okay, so he's already pushing a bunch of pawns and weakening his position. That's a, that's a clue that we need to open up the center ASAP. So in what way are we going to open the center up? And, and first we're going to castle, and we're going to open it up after we castle. So the move is going to be d5, but let's not rush with that move. Let's castle first. He's probably going to develop his bishop. Um, my guess is perhaps the c4. Uh, and that's actually just going to add more fuel to the fire because d5 is going to come with tempo. Uh, this move is so strong that he's disconnected. Okay, bishop b2, and now we go d5. Now, we don't need to actually prevent him from castling. That's not necessarily the entire point. We're just trying to expose the weaknesses in his position. And even if he castles, uh, he doesn't necessarily... Well, whoa, Bobby Boucher with 10 gifted. Thank you, and a great game. Uh, amazing stuff. The party continues. Thank you, Bobby, for the 10 gifted to the community. That is an eruption of subs indeed. Okay, so what do we do in this position? How do we continue accumulating the pressure? Uh, perhaps, you know, just generally applying more pressure on his position. There's a great square for this knight, and that is the f4 square. Yes, knight f4 is very typical. Um, awesome. Well, welcome. Okay, so this at, at this level already... This is where tactics come into play, right? This is when you need when you need to start looking at tactics. And when I look at this position, what do I see? I see the fact that knight takes e2 uh, just sort of exists. So there is a tactic at the end of which you play knight takes e2, and knight takes e2 is actually a fork. Can anybody find this tactic in its entirety? Can anybody find this tactic in its entirety? And it's and it's a pretty difficult tactic. So you just take everything on g4. There's an eruption on g4. There is an eruption on d4, and actually we take on d4 with the queen, which is actually a very typical type of tactic. I don't even know what to call it. I guess it's removing the defender, but we basically force white's queen onto a forkable square. Then we take the bishop, and then we recapture the queen and a piece. So how you see this? Well, that's why we put knights on active squares. When you have a knight like that on f4, okay, he's gone king h1. So he's chosen simply not to recapture the piece. We're just going to move the bishop back. And we're going to be up a full bishop with this knight also making... Call. Okay, so he's gone into the end game, but this is completely lost. So it's it seems complex, but the reality is if you understand the underlying idea, uh, which is the fact that his position is already almost crumbling, then you should already be looking for tactics to start. Okay, and, and if you solve... This is where just like solving tactics helps. Uh, because if you just solve a lot of tactics, and here we're just going to infiltrate to the to the uh, second rank, and we're going to start the process of completing this game. But uh, this is not terribly difficult to sense this. Uh, I, I don't want to make it seem like this is some sort of black magic. The fact is that the knight is on f4, the bishop on e2 is poorly defended, and so all of these factors put together uh, are responsible for there being a tactic. I'll, I'll fully explain this uh, after the game. Okay, so he's on g3, and the knee-jerk reaction for most people would be to move this knight, right? He's attacking this knight, we have to move it. Uh, but but the reality is we do not have to move this knight. How do I know that? Well, look, take a look at, at Black's, White's king for a second. Does the king have any squares? Nope, g1 is covered by our bishop. g2 is covered by our rook. So we should already be looking for mating patterns uh, regardless of the fact that the knight is hanging, and we find one in the form of bishop h3, aiming for the g2 square, which is going to be checkmate, and the game is over. 
So the Sicilian is a great weapon at this level if you know how to play it because people are kind of aimlessly floundering around and you can see how potent it is once we open up the center, we get the knight to f4 and we win the game very, very quickly. Now, before we start the next game, I'm just gonna explain what was the point if white captures on d4. We play queen takes d4. And uh, this is a very nice move. Uh, we sack the queen temporarily, but now the knight recaptures the bishop and it's a fork. If the king moves away, which he should have done, then we actually also take on b2 and it's another fork. Uh, and we see this chain reaction often, like when the position opens up like this, uh, everything starts collapsing. So I highly, highly recommend the Accelerated Dragon as a gateway into the Sicilian. If you want to learn the Sicilian, but you're worried about tons of theory and getting checkmated, the Accelerated Dragon is very approachable. Uh, there isn't a uh, forbidding amount of theory, uh, and the ideas are relatively easy to understand, and there's a lot of traps. So it's got it all, and it's actually not an objectively bad opening, right? It's it's Magnus plays it, and it's uh, it's quite difficult for White to prove an advantage even at a grandmaster level. So, uh, well, when did I decide to open up the center? Well, when he played f3, because the moment he played f3 is the moment that he weakened his bishop. It's the moment he weakened his kingside, and when that kind of move is played, it alerts in me the desire to open up the center, which I could have done immediately, but I decided first to castle just to be a little bit on the safe side. It's not like he's going to stop me from playing d5. Um, how did this escalate? Well, because he's just not developing. He's just weakening his position. Okay, so as I said, guys, I play three three games at a time. And uh, after those games are concluded, I go through each one in, in greater detail. So let's play the next two games, and then I will answer everybody's questions, I promise. All right, let's go e4. And, um, okay, so he's playing the modern. The modern is uh, an opening where black immediately fiend Kedos his bishop. This is a, an opening that you might see me playing in Blitz. I, I don't recommend it to beginners because it requires a, a very deep understanding of, of, well, how to play against the center, and you basically yield control over the center. Now, how should we play here if we are white? What, what do we do here? And there's a very brute force approach, which I would recommend, uh, which really tests uh, your opponent's understanding. Black is just pushing out a lot of his pawns. He's creating a lot of targets. And we can actually just start attacking one of these targets. Well, we don't want to play f4, uh, but that's the right idea, right? We want to push a pawn to the h file. We're actually going to play h4. Uh, you guys, I'm sure, have... Well, and he immediately responds with h5. But what square does h5 actually weaken? Where can we actually put one of our pieces now? And this creates a threat, and it essentially causes a chain reaction. I mean, h5 is already a mistake, right? So we can bring our bishop to g5. Uh, he goes bishop f6. Uh, and at this point, I've already talked about positional concepts quite a bit, and, and here I'll reinforce them. By playing bishop f6, he's offering us a bishop trade, which I will accept. And by offering us a bishop trade, look at his dark squares. They have been tremendously weakened by this move g6 and e6. How do we cement our control over those dark squares? Yes, Bay War is correct. We go e5. And now the f6 square is firmly under our control. But let's not forget that we also need to develop our pieces. Uh, we need to combine control over the dark squares with piece development. So, so let's first take a moment to complete our development, okay? Let's first complete our development. And I always remind people of how important that is. Now we're just going to go to f3. And later, we're going to try to get this knight over to f6. Before we do that, we can actually make another development move here uh, with Tempo. And it, it's a great move. It prepares castles long, uh, and it attacks one of our opponent's pieces, and that is the move queen to d2. And later on, you can imagine that the queen can perhaps maneuver to g5 and uh, start attacking, perhaps if the knight ends, ends up on f6. And now we just uh, maneuver the knight over to this beautiful fortress on f6, where it's protected... Sorry, outpost on f6, where it's protected by the pawn on e5. Pawn on e5 is protected by the pawn on d4, and, and that is the power of a pawn chain, right? It's very hard to break that up. Now, how are we going to actually continue? Well, knight d7, that's a very, very good move by our opponents, uh, which I will be honest to you guys, I, I underestimated this move. Uh, but, but part of chess mastery is the ability to react to unforeseen developments, right? I didn't entirely appreciate this move myself, uh, and one of the things that players really, really struggles, uh, really, really struggle with, is the ability to admit 
their mistakes. The, the ability to just say, you know what, I, you know, I played this move and uh, the, the move wasn't great. So guess what? I'm just going to bring, bring the knight back to e4. Okay, time to retreat. Uh, and and uh, my longtime coach uh, for, for many years, Gregory Kaidanov, he called this saying sorry, right? Sometimes you just have to say sorry. That's a lot better than stubbornly continuing with your plan. So now we're going to castle. And this queen from d2 needs to be brought to a more active square in order to act as the glue that'll keep the e5 pawn better defended. Now we're just starting to accumulate pieces on the king side in preparation for an attack. Our opponent is trading bishops. Fine, I don't care. Let's trade. And how are we going to go about continuing the attack? Uh, in order to continue the attack, we need more pieces. Uh, we have a very typical attacking mechanism that can be used to bring another piece into the attack. What am I talking about? It's the RL. Those are the initials of the strategy that we can put on the board right now. Well, we can double. We can also rook lift. Uh, it, both options involve our rooks. I really actually like the double idea of doubling rooks on the d file. Why are we doubling rooks on the default? Well, we're doubling rooks in order to attack the knight. Why are we trying to attack the knight? Because we want to get our knight to f6. Just because we retreated that knight from f6 earlier doesn't mean that that's not a good idea in the long term. Uh, we want to put that knight on f6. That's going to be huge for our attack. Uh, and in order to do that, we'll have to get that knight out of d7. Uh, we could have sacked on d7, but I didn't see a need to do that. I think that would have been a little bit too drastic. And now he's got to move his knight. I don't see a way for him to defend it. If he goes rook d8, we're going to have insurmountable pressure on the d file. And we're going to be able to explore. Okay, so he's gone rook d8. Typical mistake. What he doesn't realize is this rook on d8 is in our crosshairs. If his knight moves from d7, we'll be able to capture on d8. So now a very simple tactic wins the game. We go knight f6. If he takes on f6, we don't immediately grab the rook on d8. What do we do first? If he takes on f6, how do we win the maximal amount of material? We actually play e takes f6 check, intermediate move, intermezzo. And that's how you find intermediate moves, right? You don't rush into just assuming that you take the first material that presents itself. You just take a second and ask yourself, all right, wait, how can I get the most out of the position? Okay, I can take the knight with check first, and then I can take the rook. And okay, so now it is time to the victor belong the spoils. We take on d7. Not only have we won a piece, but our rook is now at a prime attacking location. Uh, in order to bring the most benefit out of that location, we need to involve one more piece into the attack. And those dark squares, okay, queen b4, let's be on alert. He's made a tricky move. Gotta attend to this. But just because it's the end game doesn't mean that the attack has evaporated. What move am I talking about? How do we bring that final piece into the attack with devastating effect? Knight to g5 is correct. We're going to take on f7 or we're take on e6 because the pawn is pinned. And uh, essentially the game is over. We are also a piece. So let's just take all of the pieces. Yeah, intermezzo is the, is the sort of Italian way to say intermediate move. Uh, so here, th there's many ways to win. Um, one piece of general advice that I have to share with you guys in, in such endgames is uh, the common phrase that is used here uh, in endgames in general, which is do not hurry. Uh, that's sort of a Russian kind of maxim that's that's told often to beginners and to kids, do not hurry in the endgame. And that means several things. First of all, there's a tendency to play fast in the endgame. And second of all, there's a tendency to play fast on the board, right? There's a tendency to just try to rush your ideas, but sometimes you just want to improve your position. And that is the most effective way of... Um, you know, of, of, of converting an advantage quite often. Let's play the last game and then we will analyze. Okay. So we're playing a Russian Sorota. Sirota, that means orphan. Orphan nine. Okay. C5. Um, C4. Okay, so he's playing the Smith Mora. Probably. Nope, he plays queen takes d4. Not a good move. Why not? What do we do? I know. Knight c6. Yeah, this is weird. Um, he's just letting us develop a tempo, and now we develop again, and his queen is going to get in the way. Now, he's playing sort of the center game against the Sicilian, but that's not how this works. Now, you guys already know from so many games that I've played, how do we deal with this kind of opening play? What move do we make, and what is the strategy behind that move? 
And this is not the only way of playing. We can also fee and keto our bishop. That would be a great idea. But let's open up the center with d5, right? Our first impulse in situations when we are anticipating a big lead in development is to open up the center, but to do so strategically, right? You don't want to sacrifice like eight pieces to open up the center. You want to do so in a manner conducive to your further development. Okay, he's gone bishop d3. Um, and we have several approaches here we can we can take and, and take out of his bishop, and, and that would be fine. But uh, let's, let's uh, control some more of the center. Let's go e5 and open up our bishop and control some more of the center. We want him to be the one to take on d5. Why? Uh, because then we capture back with a knight, and our knight is nicely placed in the center. Okay. Uh, let's continue our development in a very uh, non-intrusive way. Uh, and I've made this point to you guys before. Uh, not every development move has to be equivalent to finding a coronavirus vaccine. Like, it's fine to develop in a simple, straightforward manner, and that is what I'm going to do with, with bishop e7. But isn't the bishop passive here? Like, why are you not putting it on b4? Well, because we're just trying to develop in castle, right? You don't always have to look for the most aggressive square for every one of your pieces. Uh, then you're just going to, you know, you're going to lose on time on move five. Uh, and when when you talk about development, the role of development is to put your pieces on decent serviceable squares, not to just like, you know, I don't know, go crazy and checkmate every opponent on move five. Queen d2 is, is a very weird move. I assume that's a mouse slip. He blunders a fork. The knight defends the pawn, and so he loses a piece. And that was the consequences of him moving his queen around in the opening. Okay, don't over tucked. That's right. I am not going to flag. Uh, don't worry. I, I, I am a professional. Okay. Um... Rumor has it I've played a couple bullet games in my life. Okay, so he has to decide which piece he gives up. Um, he's busted either way, and I, I don't think he's very happy right now uh, by the time he's expending here. Okay, let me let me um, change the title. So uh, if I were him and I had to actually make something out of this, okay, I would not do this because now in addition to giving up a piece, he's, I mean, look at this, he's ruining his pawn structure. And so in terms of, we've talked about two methods of converting uh, material advantages. One is to trade as much as possible. The other is attacking. What does his move tell us about which of these plans we should choose? Do you guys think we should now trade all the pieces or should we close the avenue of negotiation between the queens and start attacking. Clearly we should attack, right? And this isn't rocket science. He's just weakened his king like this. And the way that we would attack is by playing knight to d4. Knight to d4 closes the avenue of negotiation between the queens. And we are actually kind of forking, the pawn on f3, forking a fork, as I like to say. And we're attacking the bishop, forcing the bishop back to e2. Then we're going to take on h3 and mate is going to come within three, four moves. Uh, because his king is, is wide open. Okay, so he's giving up his queen instead. Botez gambit, and the game is over. Uh, so that was relatively straightforward. That decision logic uh, is, I think, relatively instructive. We kind of detect the clues in the position. He resigns. And uh, that was very straightforward. Okay, let's very quickly go through the, uh, the three games we played. Now, in this game, <clears throat> uh, there was a question about going e5. And th the move e5, in general... I see a lot of players falling for a temptation like this. But when you look at this move positionally, what is the drawback? What is the drawback of the move e5? If you look at it from a positional standpoint, the bishop now aims at a wall. I personally, and it's not just a personal thing, you've got to be very careful about the situation. Because I don't know when you're going to get this pawn out of e5. And it's a pretty big deal when you block your bishop like this. So you better have a pretty damn good reason to do that. And when there is an equivalent way of opening the center, to make this kind of positional concession is a little bit dubious. Now, it's still not a very bad move because you could follow up with d5 and essentially later on you can move that pawn out of e5 to e4. Uh, but uh, I would say be very careful about what I call static. And again, I'm saying what I call, but I didn't invent any of these terms. Um, trust educators far greater than me invented them. But basically the concept of static weaknesses, right? Weaknesses that cannot be corrected uh, very easily and might be 
essentially permanent, that is what you need to be very careful about. And that involves and includes things like making a piece very bad by having it stare at a wall or weakening a particular square for a long period of time. Those things uh, should be done very, very carefully. And you should only do them if you have a very, very good reason to do that. Okay. The move e6 would be similarly dubious because it would weaken this d6 square. And I've shown you guys an example of why uh, you want to be very careful in the Sicilian specifically about combining the moves g6 and e6. And part of the reason is that you leave unattended this complex of dark squares. Okay, and he can slam that outpost into d6. Right off the bat, if you guys want, I've and I've actually shown you guys. Uh, a couple of illustrative examples of what happens when a knight lands on d6 like this, it can paralyze black's entire queenside uh, for the rest of the game. I mean, it's particularly if a pawn were to then advance and support that knight. So let me actually give you a very straightforward example of, uh, of such a game from my own career. And um, I, well, there's a couple of, there's a couple of games I could show you, a couple of positive experiences and negative experiences. But here is a good illustration. So this is one of my, this is actually one of my best games. Uh, I was an IM when this game was played. I, I was white. Okay, this was after I got my third GM norm, uh, but I was still like an IM. And I was playing a, a pretty strong GM, as you guys can see. Thank you, peanut butter jello time. And look what happens. I sacrifice a pawn, as usual, um, and I manage to get a knight to d6. And this is the Sicilian. Look at this knight very, very carefully. It basically remains there for most of the game, completely, par completely paralyzing black's position. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm accumulating the pressure. e5, here comes the pawn that guards the knight. It's chess base, guys. It's not Microsoft Word. It's just modeled after Microsoft. And now a very nice move, knight f5. The knight basically leaves d6, but only to sacrifice itself. What is the idea after g takes f5? What is the idea? And it's a very simple move. It's not really a sacrifice because he can't really take. Bishop h6 and it's checkmate because this bishop blocks the f1. So he can't set up this link between the queen and the bishop. Uh, and so he was forced to go queen e8. Now I simply collect the pawns, uh, but the rest is very simple. Bishop f6, and I hunted his king down to checkmate g4. He resigned here because after king f4, uh, it's just checkmate. So yeah, uh, this was a pretty good game. And you can see that it all started from me establishing that knight on d6. Uh, the game was very one-sided. He just didn't manage to do anything. Um, okay. So that was a positive experience, but I also had a negative experience of weakening that particular square. Uh, and here you guys go fast or rewind, I suppose, to 2005. I am 1800 and I'm playing against this guy. And guess what I do? G6 and E6. Boom, boom, yeah, bang, bang, boom. Okay, one after the other and he wins a rook. Okay, so this game was a cautionary tale to me about not playing g6 and e6 together in the Sicilian because it leaves these squares unattended. I won the game in the end. Uh, I managed to swindle him. But, well, and by the way, those of you who are like, how did you, I have a database of my games from, you know, as early as 2004 onwards, and I just searched it. Um, I remember, roughly speaking, the opening from all of my games so I can sort of track them down quickly. Uh, particularly the memorable games. So in any case, I won't have, I won't show the entire game. I managed to win his knight back and I made things interesting and then I won his rook back. And well, I, um, I played a nice game to swindle him, but the fact remains, this was my cautionary tale. Uh, during the reset of the uh, server, I will, uh, I will show some more of my early games. Okay, so in any case, that's the rationale behind d5, long story short. And then, of course, we find this tactic, and the rest is very simple. In this other game, the move h4 is what I want to explain. I, I want people to understand the logic behind the move h4. What is the logic behind this move? Um, well, idle strategies, uh, chess base is not a competitor for chess.com, so I'm allowed to use it. Uh, I wouldn't use Lee Chess, for example. 
Uh, it's just base is not a playing server. It's just a server to analyze. Uh, although it, it does have a, a playing server as well. Uh, so this move has, has two, well, it has one main goal and then it has a positive byproduct. The positive byproduct of this move is that it controls the g5 square and it prepares our bishop's development to g5. But let me be very clear. As Obama would say, Loma Bukur, Loma Bukur. Uh, this doesn't only protect g5. We also use the pawn as a battering ram and we prepare to advance it to h5. Why would we advance the pawn to h5? Because now this pawn on g6 is weak. And the pawn from h5 would threaten to open the h file, which could be good for us, or it can advance all the way to h6. And now it's literally a bone in black's throat. The bishop has to go either to f6, and now the knight can't develop to f6, or it has to go to f8. Blech. So this brings to the table some very unpleasant consequences. Okay, and That is why I really, really like the move h4. Our opponent, understandably enough, played h5. But now we get our bishop to this incredibly just solid outpost on g5. He tries to dislodge it, but in doing so, he weakens all of these dark squares around his king, which after completing our development, we are able to occupy with our pieces and use as the basis for future attack. This move knight f6 was a mistake. Uh, I missed the move knight d7, and here we just said, all right, I'm sorry, I'm going back. Let's complete our development first, double the rooks, and only now on a second attempt, we go knight f6 only when we're ready to do uh, we have a great question from Noisy Miner. What if Black would have played the cunning h6? The idea of h6 is he brings the g5 square under his control. And if we go h5, he goes g5. Well, when I look at this pawn on g5, I see a hook. Uh, I've explained the concept of a hook before. Uh, what can we do with this? So how do we explain it? What, what should White do here? And this is a very, very typical sequence, right? h5 and now the following move, which is what? Let's rip open that kingside. Boom. F4. If he takes, look at his bishop. We might put a queen on g4. I mean, that entire kingside is in a world of hurt. And so white has uh, tremendous attacking possibilities here. Now, I'm not claiming that um, that white is uh, winning, but I, I, tr I do think that this is, well, I, I think this is, um, one second. When do you know when to blow up side center door? Well, we have the center control. We have more development than our opponent. And so we kind of know that we should open up the center. In any case, that was that game. And then the final game was a very simple one. This move, bishop e7, is just one I wanted to emphasize. Uh, a lot of people would want to play the move d4. But, but the move d4 would be counterproductive. Uh, and I want to make the point here that it's not all about grabbing space in, in chess. Okay? Uh, because the move d4, it may look productive, but what it actually does is it closes up the center. It closes up the center and it allows White to, to justify his, you know, overzealousness with his queen. Because now the queen comes back to e2 where it's perfectly safe. And when the center is closed, a lead of development isn't as easily and strongly felt as it is with the center open for obvious reasons, right? You know, it's just that the center is closed, so you start the slow maneuvering game. Okay, so I just wanted to make the point that d4 uh, is a move that may look good, but in reality, it closes the center, and that favors, uh, generally speaking, the side that is lacking in development. Any questions? Any questions? Or shall we move on to the next set of games? Wow, 2,500 viewers, crazy. Question by Mariel100. Yes, go ahead. How can we assess what? Please be specific. I would love to be a high school teacher, yes. History. Maybe I will be one day. When do you move the rook up and then to the center? I'm not, again, I, it's hard for me to answer those kinds of general questions. Assess to open up center if they have vulnerable pieces. Well, okay. So let me put it this way. There's three, let, let's imagine a situation where there is tension in the center, okay? And this is what I would quantify as tension, right? 
There's two pawns that are at a standoff. There's three fundamental things that you can do. You can not do anything and simply continue developing. You can actively try to open up the center more and release the tension, that's d takes d4, or you can try to close the, the tension with d4. Let's uh, thank you, king, uh, move for the prime. And we can transfer that to a bunch of scenarios. Um, generally speaking, the first of these options uh, is what I prefer, unless it is specifically good in some way to continue opening up the center. Because generally when there is a source of tension, such as pawns at a standoff, you want your opponent to be the one to release that tension and help you put your pieces on better squares. My friend Dana McKenzie, a national master, and, and he's a, actually a best-selling author now, he calls this moving your opponent's pieces. Uh, you want to be very careful about moving your opponent's pieces. Your white is essentially moving my knight to a better square, to an outpost on t5. So that is why players who are able to keep the tension in certain positions uh, are very, very successful uh, because that is not an easy thing to do, okay? There is no algorithm that I can offer, but this is the closest I can come. For this board, would you check the king with bishop b4? Asks Travman. Good question. Now, bishop b4 would be good were it not for the annoying move c3, blunting the diagonal and attacking the bishop. So you could do this, right? You could drop the bishop to a5 and then to b6. That would be a perfectly viable maneuver, but... Uh, if it were not for the move c3, bishop b4 would cause some trouble. Although I guess why I could play bishop d2 also and develop the bishop. I generally think that bishop b4 check or bishop g4 is overrated. Uh, you want to be sort of... Developing with check is good, uh, but it's not always as good as it may appear. 